Welcome to the Unified Brand Podcast, brought to you by Elements Brand Management, a weekly brand building and brand strategy podcast to help you unlock your brand's potential, stand out from the competition, and create impact. Today we're joined by Mark Christou, former creative director at Pearlfish in New York and now co-founder and creative partner of independent creative agency Rook NYC and founder and partner of Arco Ventures. Great to have on the Unified Brand Podcast, Mark. We get to learn more about yourself, what you do, Rook and Arco. Thanks for having us, Chris. Well, just a quick bit about Rook. Started in February 2012. I've been going, you know, 10 years now. And, you know, my past life was, has always been in design, branding, and packaging. I got to work, you know, at Pearl Fisher, London, then moved to New York with them and then became the creative director there. So I got some good education from some great creative directors and co-workers and took all that kind of experience and that knowledge and the passion I had for branding and packaging and sort of then put that into my own baby with Rook. I co-founded the business with my wife, Rebecca, and she's a great kind of uh, you know counterpoint to me. Uh, she's the business side on kind of the creative side, but we kind of, we dovetail back and forth as well to support each other in those roles. So we started the business on the back of, you know, really trying to partner with, you know, founders that had a really interesting vision, really interesting product. And, you know, the world didn't, frankly, at the time, need another design agency, arguably. But the way that we kind of tried to position ourselves was, you know, through this this term that we have, which is partners in brand. So we really tried to go deep with our clients. We really tried to partner with our clients in ways that isn't just an exchange for, you know, services. So we tried to be flexible. We, you know, in some cases, we've worked with clients. We've had a six-year relationship working with, with our clients. It just started out as one, one simple little project. So that was always the vision, was to go really deep with our clients, to work with clients that had great products, great services, and us to do our job, which is to create a great brand experience, great package design. And we did that. You know, I think we've done that pretty successfully to date. You know, we've had the opportunity to work with at the time, some challenger brands like Ann Pizza and Health Aid Kombucha. And they, you know, Health Aid Kombucha, I think, was in our, our design, you know, glass bottle and our label for nearly 10 years. And Ann Pizza is still rocking our same identity that we created in, I think it was about 2013. And they're a fast casual pizza shop. And they're, we started out and they started out with one store in DC on H Street. And they're now up to like 54 stores. And wow. Michael and I are very good friends. Most of our clients actually have become sort of clients and have become friends just for the nature of what we do. But that was the thing that really excited me as a creative and as a founder is to have those, to build those connections and those partnerships. And then as we progressed through, you know, our, our years, we started to play with the idea of investment. And very early on, that was more like a sweat equity. So sweat equity sort of deals. You know, clients, startup clients specifically, you know, didn't necessarily have the capital to invest the full amount that a project would take with us. Um, so in some cases we we exchanged, you know, fees for, for equity and businesses. As we've sort of grown or grown up and sort of maybe been burned and had some sort of couple of successes, I think what we've the way we've tried to now formalize it is we've come up with this arm called Arco Ventures, which has been sort of founded by myself and two other business partners that come from varied backgrounds. And we sort of now strictly invest capital into brands versus a sweat equity. And the reason that we set it up and the, and the, the vision I had for Arco Ventures was, kind of, you know, much like yourself, you know, when you get startups come through the door or, you know, even sort of mature agent you know, companies, you see the opportunities like, wow, this is a really interesting product. Wow, this is a really fascinating founder. You know, it could be a first time founder or a third time founder. And, you know, we get the inside look in the way that that founder operates, the market that they're sort of going after and the opportunity that they have. So, you know, in some cases we've had early looks on businesses that typically other VCs might not get a look at. So we formalized Arco so that we could actually create the vehicle to invest in some of those opportunities. Now, the investment thesis is we don't invest in businesses that Rook hasn't worked on. Rook is the funnel, is the, is the pipeline. We don't try to invest you know, into 10 deals a year. We're looking for one or two. We're looking for highly qualified deals and companies that we've had the opportunity to work with. So we've almost done our internal due diligence. 
uh, more so on the founder and the team and the product more than you know maybe other VCs would look at it and do their you know how they would do their due diligence. So that's kind of been the thinking, and we've made three deals into one company, Culture Pop Soda, which is doing fantastic, and we've got some other really interesting ones in the pipeline that we've been working on as well. Um, so you know, Arco doesn't exist without Rook. And that was the vision I had sort of 10 years ago, but it's taken 10 years or nine years to kind of formalize that. That's really cool. I love the idea of partner in brand. I think that's a really great statement. So from that, there's a couple of questions actually from that that came out of what you just said. I mean, I love the idea of, like you said, that investment funnel almost. You get a chance to have a look at the companies first and, and also that you've had to work on them first because that gives you a really good insight, like you said, into who the founder is and how they operate. But the partner in brand idea as well plays into that. And I like the idea. And do you think that it's important for a relationship with a brand and a successful brand to have that relationship on a long-term basis? Yes, 100%. I believe in it. And I frankly, you know, I would, you could definitely argue there's probably every design agency has a form of that. Everyone believes in a relationship and partnership. I think for us, like we're just a really good example of partnering brand. We've been working with a awesome company, husband and wife co-founder called 88 Acres up in Boston. And we've been working with them for about four years. It's a seed-based company. So they make granola that's you know, made with seeds and they do seed butter. So it's all allergen friendly. It's all used, you know, pumpkin seeds, watermelon seeds. So, so it's a really fascinating brand and brand story and products. The products are absolutely delicious. Again, they're the things we look for. But we started working with them about four years ago and we sort of, you know, it was a typical kind of design project where they launched, they gone into market, they looked very kind of granola, crunchy, brown wrapper. They did a great job to get the brand off the ground, but they needed to just be elevated up. Um, you know, they were in Whole Foods and, you know, we've, we've had a ton of experience with brands in Whole Foods. So we kind of knew what the exercise was. It was to sort of just invigorate the brand, bring it to life. And we did that, like I say, four years ago. And two years after that redesign, the pandemic hits. Now all of a sudden they're a brand that can't, you know, be in store doing a tastings, which is the way that they would typically grow the brand because what's a seed bar? It isn't seeds for, for birds. Uh, so with that, we took a step back and we worked with them and their board and their, their investors to say, if we can't now do tastings in store, how can we then elevate this brand so that we're taking away that need to have the consumer taste it to understand what it is and that it's going to be delicious first and foremost. So we designed our own redesign, right? And we did that in collaboration with the team. And then we went from there to then, you know, working on some marketing work for them. Then that's now snowballed into us being sort of their internal, external creative directors. Right. So we've gone from just a redesign project in 2018 to redesigning our own work to now working internal with their team, helping their team grow, working on bigger things for them, becoming their you know, internal creative directors, like I said, and that's true partnership. I think to redesign your own work is very interesting challenge, but we weren't fighting it. We were embracing it and we were working very collaboratively with a team. And that to me is just a really good example of the way that we think about partnership. We're not here to just sort of stick with, you know, trying to do a winning design and be stuck in the mud with like, this is the way it needs to be. We have to work and listen to our clients and their challenges and their needs. And, and we need to adapt quickly. And that's just the way that we try to operate. There's no ego in what we do for sure. So I think that's a really good example of partnering brand. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think it's interesting to hear about rebranding your own work. Like you said, it must be challenging. It must be interesting to sort of reapproach that from a different angle. What is your process? How do you take clients through the journey? What's the sort of design and creative process you go through? We keep it as streamlined and as simple as possible. We try not to upsell bullshit. Like we're not trying to give them a strategy if they don't need a strategy. We're not trying to give them a naming exercise if they don't need it. We're really focused on trying to understand what the objective is, what's the end goal for the client, where they want to get to, and then we kind of plug in our kind of services. But typically a creative process for us is you know, streamlined to three stages, the create phase, the develop phase, and then the realize phase. Again, not rocket science. And in the creative phase, I'd say the creative phase is the phase where we sort of are less collaborative with the client. Obviously we'll take the briefing, we'll develop the creative brief with the client, making sure that we're very clear on what the objective is and you know, what the guardrails are. 
what we want to take from the existing design or what do we want to take from the market if it's a you know, brand creation project uh, as inspiration. And um, so really kind of work collaboratively on the brief with the client and then we then go away and we run our process, you know, the creative process, which is just coming up with at least three to four concepts against that brief. Typically that runs from anywhere from like three to five weeks, depending on the project size. And at the end of that phase, we kind of go back to the client with, you know, like I say, very different concepts. You know, if it's a redesign project or it's a, co you know, creation project, whatever it is, we're really creating, you know, very different concepts for the client to react to. Because I think what's important about that process for us and Health Aid Kombucha was a really good example of this. They thought they had a nice package and they did, but it was nowhere near where it needed to be to sort of be mass premium, which is where I think it goes very farmer's market driven or feeling, you know, brown label, lots of kind of details and it sort of felt a bit too ornate. So what we did presenting back to them was to show them, okay, we've heard what you want or what you think you want, so we've moved it on. But then actually, here's where you could go. And here's all the kind of ideas in between that. So we try to really present a range for a client, you know, so that we're kind of injecting our expertise into probably the sort of further out direction, but also bringing our expertise to their closing direction by sort of, you know, fine tuning and elevating, but making it feel familiar. So we really like to take the client on that journey of close into far out. And then at the end of that, you know, we, we present that to the client and they'll obviously give us the feedback of things they like and things they don't like. And, and we always say to our clients that I think over 10 years, I've had one client say to me, that's the design. I want that after the creative phase. It's always been, we like this direction, but we love this from here. We love this from here. That's expected. It's coming from the same creative brief. So they should like more than just one concept or parts of more than one concept. So we've always said to our clients, we're not, you know, this isn't about Frankenstein and this is about collaboratively pulling together what you like and then us go away in the development phase and start to bring to life the feedback as you see it, the way that we continue to think about it. And in the development phase, that's much more iterative. So we really bring the client into the process in that development phase and we'll go through three, four rounds of development and we'll do their much shorter stints. So it's like, our, you know, week one, will be one development, week two, another development round, and we'll keep checking in with the client, showing them the progress. So they feel much more invested in that process. You know, we can add, and we do add in testing within that phase as well, if we think we need it. And some clients are, you know, or some founders are like, no, I don't need that. I trust my gut, I trust you guys. Or, you know, if it's a bigger agency, they might, or a bigger client, excuse me, they might want to do some consumer testing just to get a gut check. So that, again, we can work that in depending on the needs. And at the end of that phase, you know, we've got a solid direction that we're in love with, the client's in love with. And then the realized phase is the realized phase is exactly what it says. We, we kind of go into the artwork phase. We work very closely with their print vendors, their bottle manufacturers, whatever it might be, you know, the needs of the product or, you know, the execution. We work very hand in hand with those, the production vendors. Obviously, one thing is to create a great piece of design and get it all the way to sort of production and then you know you give it to a production vendor and then it can fall flat very very quickly so we're very going high with our clients that we are heavily involved in that last phase to really see through the potential of the design cool so in terms of that process like you said and the development that you do what are some of the biggest errors that you see businesses making with their packaging that is potentially common quite common but is something they shouldn't be doing i mean this could come across a bit arrogant but like you can ask too many questions about what people think about your, you know, your package design. I think it's one thing to get input from friends and family or you know, even consumer groups. It's another thing, you know, it was, it was supposed to embrace the area that it was founded in. It was on H Street, like I said in DC, and that area had a richness to it, had a culture to it. So we actually, the idea was about how can we bring that culture in you know, whether it's music, it's food, it's pizza, it's all these great, these great parts that, that make up a community. And that was kind of what we th I threw out this kind of idea. Well, it's actually, it's not about pizza first. It's actually about pizza as the foundation. So it's music, it's friendship, it's love, it's all these things and pizza. And then <laughs> I think we went back and forth on it and he couldn't quite grasp the concept that it could just be and pizza. 
So we added the H to it. So it's H and pizza, so it's about the location. And then subsequently, the next four stores became the area the stores were located. So it, become, it became U Street and pizza. So it started to take on all the, the locations of, of, of DC, which, I mean, you know, frankly, I think it's easy to do that when it's called H Street or it's called U Street. I don't think, you know, coming up with some names on pizza would have worked, which it hasn't. Now it's become and pizza, and now it's distilled further down to just and. Um, so it, it's gone on that process which it had to, to sort of distill down to become an iconic ampersand. And that's what's represented now on all the stores. But, you know, we even spoke about really early on. I said, Michael, I think it, this is just act. I don't even think you need the pizza. We had to go on that sort of journey of discovery to get to the point. And he had to build the equity in the brand as well, I think, to go out with just an ampersand brand with just a shop would have been very ballsy of a founder. But we laughed. You know, we joked sort of six months ago. He's like, no, you were right. I said, what do you mean I was right? He said, it was always and. It was never anything more than that. And that's where we, we should have done it 10 years ago, but here we are. And it's like, you were right. So, you know, look, there's times when we we can be more progressive and think sort of clearly, but at the same time, you know, the client has to go on a journey. I think you have to support the client on that journey. And, you know, if it's picking a sans serif font over a, <laughs> a serif font, then, you know, so be it. And if we change it later, we change it later. I think some founders and some, you know, brand managers and what have you, I think, listening to people that just taking too much or asking too many questions about you know what people think i think can be a bit of a distraction at times and can be a, a bit of a cause for unnecessary um, decision making yeah it's interesting because i had an experience like that recently where we did this rebrand and the company loved it they absolutely loved it and it was on brief and it's what they wanted and then they did that they asked a few people I think it was three of the four or the five people they kind of like asked in internally were, were on board and one wasn't. And the one that wasn't for some reason got into their head in a way and they came back and wanted to change things. And like you said, you sort of, you update, you have to take them on a journey for them to then go back to what it was. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting thing. Cause I think sometimes we forget cause we've gone on the journey mentally or we can do it instinctively and they don't have those steps today to kind of, it's almost taking somebody through that to give them those options so they can see what it could look like, but then yeah. switching it back. Well, I, I think the other part of this as well is that when the shoe's on the other foot, right, like if you're that founder, you're that brand manager, like it could be your job on the line, like your your house, you've remortgaged the house to bring this vision to life. And I can totally get the nervousness, you know, and the, the anxiety of like making it, you know, not getting it right. But the one thing I would say more so now as well, is that frankly, all brands are in beta, right? There's always going to be a tweak. There's always going to be a development. The benefit of printing capabilities, manufacturing, supply chain is that things can move much quicker than they could, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But that might not be so true in today's climate with supply chain issues. But the ability to make edits and tweak is much more available to us today than it was a while back and I think that you know we say to every client when we do our redesign work or we do the co-creation work and they don't like hearing this I always say to them look we're going to go to print we're going to produce this and I'm 100% guarantee you there's going to be a tweak that's needed because it's just there's no way it's going to come out and it's going to everything's going to be perfect you're going to get reaction from the consumer you're going to get more feedback you're going to get whatever it might be there's always going to be a tweak and a development kind of component to that, you know, once that project's gone to market. So in some cases, I actually think this perfectionist kind of or anxiety that, you know, kind of feeling that these founders might have and, you know, changing the font to a serif, to a sans serif, honestly, it's so minute to slow the project down, to slow the launch date down is arguably questionable that that really needs to happen. So in some ways, I think sometimes they just need to get out of their way and get it out because the consumer will tell them, give them all the feedback they need. If it doesn't sell, then there's an issue. So we need to change something. But I don't know they're trying to mitigate that risk, but that's where, you know, us as agency owners, that's our job. We're trying to mitigate that risk. We're trying to help them grow. So I think just more trust in the creative partner and, you know, not getting too hung up on the minutia, I think is, is, is huge. Definitely. So what's some of the biggest uh, misconceptions that you see around branding and design? It's a good question. What do you think is the biggest misconception? I think with branding, a lot of the times it is 
that it's not as important as it is, but also sometimes it can be seen as being not all encompassing, I think in some regards. And I think mm -hmm. with design, I think design misconceptions around design sometimes is it, it doesn't have a mass as bigger impact as it can. Like that's the, the story you talked about earlier on was amazing with the 300% increase. I think design has a real, can have a massive impact. I think some people don't always see that or they don't see that it has that massive impact. I think also the big challenge that I've seen more recently is, and you've probably experienced this as well, and certainly through the pandemic, that anyone can be a designer and anyone can be a creative director and anyone can jump on to an AI powered logo generator website. And you touched on it, so I'm kind of riffing on your answer a little bit. I think design is a true, true profession and it's a true, true skill. And I think to understand the importance of design and brand and the power that, that can bring to a business is huge. And it is an investment. It is an investment. Now, that doesn't mean you can't find someone that can generate something really great for you, um, you know, a cut cost. But I find great agencies, I mean, Paul Fisher, JKR, you know, to name some of the big ones, what they deliver is truly remarkable work that really helps businesses grow. And I think we're doing that at a sort of different scale. And I'm sure you're doing that at a different scale also. But what we do is we're not just delivering a piece of design. We're delivering so much more than that. Design isn't just the logo. It's the tone of voice. It's the color. It's the, you know, the full packaged experience. It's the full label. It's the detail of the messaging about how that you should recycle this in a certain way. It's the, the detail that you can add into the barcode. It's all these like little elements that is true design thinking not just a big logo, not just a simple, you know, colored can with minimal type on it. It's a full experience. And I would say that is probably where we are today is that I think clients and brands think they can get some design that doesn't cost that much and will deliver results in a way that I don't need to pay this agency to do that. I can get a freelancer to do that for me. Well, the freelancer is only going to do so much for you. You're going to have to be the creative director and that's not your skill set. So actually investing in a talented agency is, is incredibly important if you want to stand out and you want the full, the full experience, I would say. So I think the bit of a misconception for me is, is that I don't have to pay these agencies to do the work. I can go and do it with a friend or a friend of a family or a cousin or whatever. And, and actually that's going to get you maybe 10% of the way, not the whole way of what you're trying to achieve. So, so I would say that. So what do you love most about helping businesses to develop their packaging and their brand? What I love most is taking a brief, looking at the challenge and thinking to myself, I don't know what we're going to do here. And then going on that journey of just discovering what you can do through the process, I think it's really fascinating. I mean, I'm creative, you know, at heart. I've always loved doing creative, you know, being creative, rolling my sleeves up, doing the drawings, getting getting on the Mac, pushing the pencil, pushing the mouse, staying up till one o'clock, you know, getting that presentation done. I just really enjoy the journey and I enjoy it. And it, it's sort of, it's funny, it's sort of, it's super exciting doing that first round creative presentation to clients, but it's also petrifying. Every project we have, it's the same feeling every single time. And if I lost that kind of feeling, I probably wouldn't want to do this anymore, to be honest with you, but I just... I love creativity. I love coming up with a solution. I love coming up with the 11th hour idea that sort of you know, wasn't on the board when you were kind of working through the process and you sort of pick it up. You know, it sort of happens the day before the presentation. I just love those kind of, those moments of creative spark. And I love seeing the reaction to when you do that presentation with the client. You know, it's so funny sort of seeing, it's become sort of a bit weirder over Zoom, right? Like the Zoom can be a bit, challenging doing these sort of non-in-person creative presentations because you know people sort of look differently on zoom and they you know i think one of our clients alex buyer from genius juice he, he did a post on this recently where he's like you know doing video calls is really challenging for me because when i think i have a very stern look and i look down which can come across like i'm not paying attention or i'm not you know i'm not intrigued or you know so it's so funny sort of 
you know, presenting to clients and seeing their reaction. And Zoom's obviously made that sort of a bit more, a bit more unique and a bit more interesting. But just seeing reactions on people's faces and getting the feedback and hearing that, generally speaking, you've done a great job and they're wowed. I think it's fascinating. It's also fascinating to sort of be in an environment, you know, being in a meeting where you haven't hit it, you know, and having that challenge to sort of work through. Just all of it. I'm just super passionate. It's something that just sort of gets me out of bed, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's interesting. That feeling of uh, before presenting that fear is something that, yeah, I get as well, to be honest. And it's an interesting one. And I think I agree with you with the fact that if you take it away, it's not as worth it. Even having that anxiety and that fear, because it pushes you to do more, to achieve more, to kind of really hit the brief, I think. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about it in that way before until you said it. So yeah, that's interesting. But I get the same thing, that anxiety just before the presentation. Yeah, it's I feel like if we, if we didn't have that, I think it would mean that we don't care enough about that project or that client. And that is why we're also very kind of, you know, we try to pick our clients as much as our clients pick us and, you know, believe in the brand, believe in the product, believe in what they're doing. So I think, yeah, to me, it's just that the care factor and the pride that we take in trying to, you know, get the right concept in front of the client that we really believe in and put together a presentation to sort of almost manipulate them in a way like you could be here but actually where you want to be is here even though you think you want to be here which was a, you know the example for burritos i mean the fact that we managed to get that specific design through you know given the size of Haynes celestial and given the size you know given this was a whole foods exclusive i think was a testament to the way that we presented the work where we started and how we got into the hip but i also think just the fact that we you know this was a, like i said it was a puff brand and you know, we just put all of our energy into trying to make this just fun and creative and you know, we really cared about sort of trying to get it to that sort of more you know iconic look and i think clients also react to that i think they react to the passion as much as they do to the design work and you know, whether you've hit the brief or not you know we're not trying to sell them the idea we're trying to you know create an idea that sells is not the way that we sort of describe it and i think they can react to that passion that energy and, and that belief you know, if you can't bring that energy and that passion and use that fear to drive that forward, then we're probably in the wrong industry. Definitely. Yeah, that was interesting. You spoke about that before we started recording, but the project you did with the packaging, where you turned it into, you said it was a bear, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, a Berritos. Yeah, it was, a, like I said, it was a puff brand with several lines and, and it was, you know, cream packaging. It had a bowl of puffs on it. It had some ingredients around that and it had this sort of cute little iconic bear above the eyebrow of, of the brand name. And, you know, it looked very staid and Celestial reached out to us to say, hey, we want to invigorate the brand. You know, we want to maintain the icon. We've built some equity around the name and the, the eyebrow logo. So we kind of want to keep that. So we had to work with some things, but we sort of took the bear and used that as our kind of our pack design. So we actually took the bear's face, so the snout, the nose, the mouth, the eyes. And we took that face. So we embraced the icon and we made that, you know, the entire pack design and, and we use the face as to, with different facial expressions to represent different flavors. And he had this like little, I guess, you know, scarf or neckerchief, whatever they call it. So in there we had the flavor and then we put the ingredients, the little puffs. So, so we went from a giant bowl of puffs to like these little puffs. And the client was super embracing of that concept. And when we launched that, I think they saw a 300% lift in sales within the first couple of weeks in Whole Foods. So it was a fun process and, you know, it's one of those ones where you think, oh, this is going to be a slight move on. You know, we might be able to make the bowl of puffs a little bit smaller, but testament to Haynes Celestial and the team that we worked with, they were, you know, really embracing of, of something pretty disruptive and proved to be a win. So That's cool. 300% is, yeah, that's awesome. So how do you actually take people on that journey? Because that's something that, you know, when you've got your concepts and you've got one direction that you think is would be good for them to take or a couple of directions you think they could go in, but you think they're going to be on one of the more milder versions maybe how do you help to take them on that journey to see that sort of end result yeah i mean you know you can look at you can look in other marketplaces where you've seen successful brands do that and so you've obviously got some physical examples you can share with the client that hey you know look this is what pistachio brand it wasn't even branded they're wonderful came out and had this iconic looking packaging and now they own the pistachio world right i think you've got examples in the market of smart redesign work or smart design work that has worked so i think you've got that i think you've got the ability to you know 
use your expertise. You've been in this game for 20 years. Like I've seen this a hundred times already. You know, again, then there's the trust level. And then I think the other really, really important part of certainly sort of maybe a more progressive design concept to help the client really understand the potential, we always develop out what a brand world could look like. So if it's a, a soda can design or it's a beer design or whatever it is, like, yes, we show the client what that looks like on the package, but hey, here's how this could look in apparel as a out of home campaign. Here's how it could look on social. Here's how it could look, you know, X, Y, and Z. So actually the way that we not manipulate, but certainly help sell in something that's maybe a little bit further out for the client is we start to show them how it could look in their world. And I think that's really, really helpful for a client to see that because in some cases we just don't know how this is gonna, how do we translate this to, you know, sales material or, you know, in-store, you know, point of sale displays. And I think it's incredibly important for us to always sort of show that. I mean, we will show that with something a little bit closer in, but if there's a concept in there that we really like and we really believe in, we'll do a few, a little bit of extra work around, you know, bringing that to life. So it's a little bit of a sort of gameplay from us on, on that one, but um, that we find incredibly helpful to sort of push through something that we're a little bit more in favor of. Cool. So when it comes to designing for packaging, what are some of the tips that you sort of give? Yeah, so we have kind of this approach where we sort of think about the 10 foot, three foot in the hand kind of rule or thinking is that we want to, you know, sort of intrigue at 10. We want to engage at three feet and we want to convince in the hand. So that's the way we think about drawing the consumer in. Now, to me, and I think if you look at our portfolio, I think arguably you can say, you know, it's bold, it's simple, it's colorful, it feels intriguing, it feels like I want to go and pick that up. So, you know, I would say that's the way we approach packaging. So we want to be disruptive on the shelf as, as best we can. We want to sort of stand out. So the colors that we choose or whatever it might be is very important to us. You know, how big is the brand logo? What's intriguing about that brand logo? So, so that when the parent is in the store with the child and has got, you know, three seconds to make a decision, can we stand out enough, you know, in this sort of sea of whatever the category might be? And can we get them to sort of, again, sort of just address the packaging? And once they've addressed it, they're starting to see the details, the nuances. And then when it's in the hand for us, the way we think about it, as, as what I was saying earlier, is, you know, it's got to be everything from the unique barcode, from the engaging tone of voice, from the little detail, you know, in the top left-hand corner. For, you know, Love Corn's a really good example of that. You know, it's this really engaging sort of love letter that on the packaging, so it's sort of, it's really romanticizing, you know, what the snack is and it feels like it's making that emotional. It's incredibly important for us that we think about it in that process to get to the sale because that's what we're trying to do. And that's the way we approach with packaging. And packaging is a fascinating medium because it's three-dimensional. You know, a can has a, it has a lid, it has a base, it's got a full wrap or a soup, a carton of soup. It's got, you know, all these sides you can play with, you know, it doesn't need to be step and repeat. It can be unique on every angle. I think, you know, Oatly done a phenomenal job at that. There's some other great brands out there that have done phenomenal jobs at understanding that it doesn't just need to be the same front and back. You can have several different faces and expressions of the brand in one single package. And I think, again, that's the way we think about it is hitting those, you know, the 10 foot, three foot in the hand kind of rule and those iconic elements all the way down to the, the detail of the, like say the barcode or the recycle. Okay, yeah, so in terms of sort of RIP NYC and Arco, what does the future hold? The long-term vision is that Rook can become a brand creation company that supports the portfolio under Arco Ventures. So, you know, where we'd love to get to, I think is we're only working on the brands that we're invested in and we're creating brands that we can invest in. I think that's the kind of the longer term vision for right now. The goal is to continue to work with some disruptive companies. The goal is to continue to build successful case studies. The goal is to continue to invest in some of those amazing brands that we get to work on and, you know, grow the team to help service that vision. And for us, we're incredibly passionate about what we do. 
And I think it's, for me, it's just about continuing to be passionate and, like I say, continue to venture into projects with clients that really excite us. And I think we have and do play a lot in the CPG space. I think we've started to venture a little bit outside of that with some healthcare communication work, some strictly brand identity work. So I think we want to kind of continue to grow, you know, into different categories and business areas. But, you know, the future is just to keep doing good work and see if we can get to a good portfolio of companies that we're invested in, that we're helping develop and work and helping them grow. Cool. So if you could wave a magic wand, what drives you mad about the industry and what would you change, alter or yeah, amend? It's a really tough question because you could piss a lot of people off by saying the wrong thing on this one. I well, think, you don't, have to, uh, don't have to answer. We can leave that one. If no, you... I think um, I think what's really interesting about our industry, and I think where it has been going for a bit, and I think there's been some agencies that have done this really, really well. I think Red Out is a really good example. I think the skin in the game approach, the getting truly invested in with our clients, is the right approach. My feeling is is that. I think what's going to happen over the course of the next five to 10 years, I think obviously there's a lot of noise right now, you know, Web3, NFTs, you know, digital this, digital that, you know, we still live in a physical world. Um, So I think there's, there's, there needs to be a way that the creative industry does become more invested. And I do believe that there's going to be, you know, more agencies are going to have a model that we have. Maybe there's an investment arm, maybe there's, capital or I think you're going to start seeing capital start to really understand the importance of brand and agencies are going to start to become a part of their service as opposed to independent and I think you're going to see less of the WPs but all these advertising agencies that are wrapped up I think you're going to start to see capital and brand kind of come together and I think that's where it should go because the skin in the game is the right game and I think it's the way that the design world will go and I think what's also going to happen because as I said earlier you know everyone's a designer now. Everyone's a creative director at 23, right? There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a skill set that needs to be learned and earned. And I think, you know, agencies that are taking their time are really you know, doing working on their craft. I think that capital is going to sort of value that and value brand even more. And I think you said it earlier that brand can be underestimated. I think brand is becoming an integral part of investment capital you know if you haven't got a good brand i think you're you're sort of you're missing a piece of the puzzle to be a super successful business or you know whatever so i think you're going to see i think you're going to see that happen more and more i think for design agencies where they're going to become a part of the capital component of business yeah it's interesting you mentioned the the nft approach and stuff like that i think that could be quite an interesting with the metaverse and things, how that comes into the physical and then the online space and how brands can extend into it. I think that's an interesting conversation. So from your point of view, have you seen any companies, it could be a client, it could be something you've seen that have really sort of recently nailed their brand and their packaging? Well, I'm going to be biased on that. So I'm going to say culture pop soda. So you kind of teed me up on that one. So I think what we've done really well with culture pop as a full team, I think Tom first, you know, seasoned entrepreneur, you know, Andrew Gard, who you know, has created some amazing flavors and product for Culture Pop. And then the work that we've managed to do with the branding and the, the experience of that design, I think, you know, we were very, very cognizant as we were creating the brand to, for it to feel that it could work in a 7-Eleven, Whole Foods, Target, a Walmart. And with the conversations and the the outreach that we've had from retailers, that's proven to be what we've done. I think, you know, that has just been a really good example of getting everything right, getting the team right, getting the product right, getting the branding right. And I'm really excited for what we're doing. We're thinking about out of home right now, and we've got some, we just launched two new SKUs, and we're getting some really great reaction from consumers. We're seeing consumers, you know, really enjoy the product and really engage with the packaging. You know, we've opened up conversations because of the great packaging. And that to me is where I think personally, I've seen it all kind of come together, which is great because we're part owners of the company. So that's a good thing. But I think that's been a really true good example of, of a brand doing something interesting, which is helping grow the functional soda category, not being scared to be called a soda. You know, we're not trying to be a tonic. We're not trying to be anything else that 
some other players in the category have, have been a bit fearful to use that word. I think we've been bold in that approach, and we've not, you know, we've not tried to be too cool for school. You know, I think cool is great. Cool sells maybe in the West Coast and you know New York and LA, but you know we want to. Culture pop has always been about sort of can we be something for everyone, and I think that's so far that looks to be you know what we've managed to what we're managing to achieve at this point. I'm really excited about that and see where that goes. That's cool. That's awesome. I'll put a link below for that. Where can we find out more about Rook, Arco and yourself? And I'll put the links in the show notes, but is there someone they can yeah. go to find out yeah. more? So Arco, so rookmyc.com is, is our website. I can be hit up on LinkedIn. You know, just Mark Christo on LinkedIn. And you know, email address mark at rookmyc.com for any questions or intrigue and any of the stuff that we've been doing. You know, love kind of having one-to-one conversations with individuals like yourself and, and your viewers. So yeah, that's the primary ways to get to me. Cool. Well, it's been awesome having you on. I really appreciate you coming on for a conversation and uh, yeah, it'd be great to do it again sometime. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it, man. We've just put together a weekly brand tip video series, which is designed to help you to unlock your brand's potential and stand out from the competition. And if you're interested, if you just go to elementsbrandmanagement, or one word, .co.uk forward slash weekly hyphen brand hyphen tips, Sign up and you'll be delivered a three to five minute video a week straight to your inbox. I'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to receive more, you can subscribe in all the usual places. We're talking iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. Please, if you get a chance, rate and review. It helps the podcast to kind of get a bit more visibility and allows us to keep on producing these podcasts. Have a great week. Catch up soon. Keep those brands unified. Bye-bye.